Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Ann Peters from the Pulitzer Center. We'll get started here in a few moments with today's conversation between journalists Marvin Kalb and James Verini, focusing on the situation between Ukraine and Russia. As we wait for more folks to join us, please let us know in the chat where you're listening in from. If you'd like to learn more about the Pulitzer Center, I wanted to give a shout out to our recently released annual report, where you'll find highlights from the year past. Amazing reporting, terrific photography, and unique educational programming that we hope you will explore further. The Pulitzer Center supports more than 170 reporting projects each year in collaboration with news outlets around the world. We're a nonprofit journalism and education organization with the mission to elevate public engagement with these issues. While we're based in Washington, DC, our staff and our work are global. As with today's event, we aim to create opportunities for learning and conversation through the reporting throughout the year. Our hope is that we, you will continue to join us and please also consider becoming a Pulitzer Center champion to support our work. A few logistics for today. We'll start with a conversation between our guests and then there will be opportunities for questions from the audience. You'll see a Q&A icon on your screen and you can begin adding your questions there at any time. There is also a chat icon that for our audience, we'd appreciate it if you use for any specific technology issues. Note that all attendees are muted, but if you cannot hear us, please let us know via the chat. We want to let you know also that we're recording this session and we'll post it online. On another note, please make sure to stay with us a bit longer after this session ends to participate in a brief survey. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Marvin Kalb spent 30 years as an award-winning reporter for CBS News and NBC News. He was the last person recruited by Edward R. Murrow to join CBS News, and he later spent time as the host of NBC's Meet the Press. He served afterwards 25 years as founding director and senior fellow of the Shorenstein Center on the Media Politics and Public Policy at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Marvin brings considerable knowledge of the region to today's conversation, including his time reporting from Russia, the Soviet Union at that point. His latest book is Assignment Russia, Becoming a Foreign Correspondent in the Crucible of the Cold War. Among his earlier books, Imperial Gamble, Putin, Ukraine, and the New Cold War. James Verini has covered global conflict for the New York Times Magazine for nearly two decades. In his Pulitzer Center supported reporting for the New York Times Magazine, he chronicles the lives of soldiers and civilians on the front line in Eastern Ukraine. James is also a contributing writer at National Geographic Magazine. His work has received a National Magazine Award and a George Polk Award. Marvin, I hand the microphone over to you. And thank you very much indeed. And welcome to James Farini. It's my pleasure to have this opportunity to talk to you, James. I am a great fan of you and I became a great fan uh, because of this marvelous piece that you have on Ukraine. It appeared a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times Magazine. I would ask as many people as possible uh, to read it because you will learn a lot about what is going on there now. I want to start with a today kind of question, James, and then go directly into your piece. But today, two things have happened directly related to Ukraine, at least two things, actually many things. <laughs> but uh, President Putin of Russia has opened up a bit, but he hasn't said anything today that's new. What he has said in effect is that he has made offers to the West to take care of Russia's needs and the West has not responded to his satisfaction. President Zelensky in Ukraine has issued a decree saying that he's ordered up an additional 100,000 troops over the next three years. Ukraine at the moment has, I believe, 260,000 troops. That means in three years, they'll have 360. The Russians now have 900 thousand troops under arms. If there were a war, in my mind anyway, there's not much doubt who's going to win 
militarily. The question is this, James. Zelensky, when he made his announcement, said that by adding 100,000 troops, that is the step toward peace. He then added soon, if not in the near future, or words like that. My question to you is, he can add 100,000 or 200,000. Is that going to get us toward peace? Well, Marvin, it's lovely to be here. It's, it's great to see you. Uh, you are a legend. Uh, and I apologize for the background here. It looks like I'm in a film noir, but uh, it's just, it's evening time here in London. Um, uh, a, lot, a lot of things there. Um, first of all, um, the, the, what I read about Zelensky um, was it's a, a tr the training of an additional roughly 100,000, a recruitment and training of civilians to train them in urban warfare and whatever it may be. Um, but on the question of the militaries, um, no, of course, Ukraine's military hardly compares to Russia's. Um, but there are many more things to take into account. Um, first of all, um, Ukraine's military is in vastly better shape than it was eight years ago, almost exactly eight years ago, when um, Russia annexed um, Crimea and then uh, sponsored and backed and armed um, the secessionist movement in uh, Donbass. Uh, at the time, the Ukrainian military, much like the Ukrainian state, was um, pretty inchoate, and it's it's a much different force than it is now. It was a much different force than it is now. There's also a great deal more um, nationalist pride uh, in Ukraine than there was eight years ago, and um, I think those are factors you have to take into account. If if let's say hypothetically, Russia were to undertake. Um, a, a very large invasion, as opposed to, say, an incursion in Donbass. Um, what they would be facing uh, is a, a long slog, um, something like that I might have faced. I don't think Afghanistan is the appropriate comparison, but it's not as, it's not as though even with 900,000 soldiers, they could overtake Ukraine. Ukraine is the second largest country in Europe, it's home to, I think, four, roughly 40 million people now. Even with a, an army, the, even with a military the size of Russia's, it would be, um, it would be dreadful and it would be long and it would not be easy. I, I have to imagine that, um, well, I don't know, God knows what's going on in the Kremlin and in the minds of Putin and his, and his advisors. Uh, you know, one of the difficult things about, um, speaking about this situation is that no one really knows that the, the Kremlin has more or less cut itself off from journalists, as you know, from Russian journalists as well as foreign journalists. And it's isolated itself from the, the foreign uh, diplomatic corps. So it's, it's not as though Putin you know, quietly speaks to <laughs> Andrew Kramer. No one really knows what the thinking is. The Ukrainian government is much more um, transparent and many of its higher ups do speak to reporters. Um, Zelensky um, strikes me and, um, and I think a lot of Ukrainians I know as at this point being rather out of his depth. And it's, um, Difficult to know how seriously to take anything that he says, um, but I don't think he is. Um, I don't think he is being disingenuous when he says that Ukrainians are preparing for and prepared for an invasion. I think that is certainly true morally, um, attitudinally. I would say probably much more than say the Russian people are prepared for another war. Probably, probably so, James. The point that I was trying to get at earlier is there are many ways of addressing and given the nature of the environment in which it lives. I'm sorry, I'm I'm to, you, you, you cut out there for a moment. Can you say the first sentence again? What I'm, what I'm trying to say is 
that Ukraine lives in a very rough neighborhood and has for hundreds of years. The question in my mind is whether military force is going to, exhibited by either side, is going to get at something you can define as peace. And if you don't like the word peace, some kind of order, some kind of system that allows both Russia and Ukraine to go on living side by side. That is what I'm trying to get at. Mm. Um, well, I should emphasize that I'm, I'm not an expert in either country. I've been to both, um, but I have not spent enough time in either to, to speak to your question really intelligently. It's a very good question. I would, say, I would say broadly, you and I both know from having covered lots of conflicts that the answer to your question is almost always no, right? It's, exactly. It yeah. usually happens that violence begets more violence. It solves very little. Um, particularly, um, you know, the principal problem, or not the principal problem, one of the very large problems, as you know, is that uh, many people in Russia, and for that matter, pe many people in Ukraine, do not consider Ukraine to be sovereign. They don't consider it to be independent, or they think um, at best that, th that the proclamation of Ukrainian independence and the creation of an independent Ukraine 30 years ago was a mistake. Um, so in the minds of many Russians and many Ukrainians, um, military action by Russia would merely be a way of re rejoining what was supposed to be one country, one people to begin with. You know, it would be, to use a very crude analogy, it would be the way in which, you know, many uh, people who are on the side of the Union in 1861 felt about the war against the Secesh. Right. This is we are reunifying a country, or we are not fighting a sovereign country. Many Russians and even many Ukrainians think that way about it. Um, at the same time, many more Ukrainians than was the case eight years ago when Russia first invaded do think of themselves as sovereign and independent, and um, um, of of uh, of particular ethnic and linguistic and cultural origins. In, in the last eight years, um, um, Ukraine has taken on an identity, which it did not have previously, and a pride. Uh, all of which is, this is not an answer to your question, but all of which is to say, there are plenty of people on both sides spoiling for a fight. And um, no, violence in a situation like this, I, I, you know, I, I, I doubt it solves anything. It may, um, it may allow Ukraine to show up Russia in a way that it has not before, um, you know, in uh, the way, no, well, this is a, that's a bad analogy. It, it could be violent, if there is serious violence, um, it could be a way for Ukraine to prove itself. Um, is well, the, an interesting, that is the best answer that comes to mind. No, but James is interesting. In your article, you, you quote someone, I think Volodya, I'm not sure of his name, who, who says, if not us, who? Which has a biblical ring to it and it appealed to me. Yeah. But if not us, who? And what he was saying at that time is when the question came up about who would fight for this new thing called Ukraine, he was pointing at his generation of young people who were yeah. born in the territory called Ukraine. And if anything has happened, it seems to me, as a result of Putin's Russia pressure on Ukraine, is that Russia has been developing, against its judgment, a Ukrainian nationalism and a strong base of Ukrainian nationalism that, historically, it had never had before. It is now a nation created by international law accepted by the Russians in one agreement after another, and now in a way imposed on Ukraine so that young Ukrainians can say, if not us, who is going to start this country called Ukraine? Yeah. And I imagine you met, James, a number of people like that in your trip. I did. Um, it was quite fascinating. It was, it, as you point out, it was very much a generational difference. Uh, 
Um, although in many Ukrainians, in many older Ukrainians, there was an there was an irony because they were trying to hold both these ideas in their mind at the same time, Soviet Union and their nostalgia for the Soviet Union, but also their pride in an independent Ukraine. It's very difficult to hold those things in your mind at the same time. So Volod the, the, the fellow you, uh, you pointed out, um, uh, if not me, who? He said to his father, and his father had been in the Soviet forces in East Germany, yes. as I recall. And um, his father, you know, had had a very dispiriting experience um, uh, serving in East Germany. And he, I don't know that his father might have had any nostalgia for the Soviet Union like so many older Ukrainians do. I tend to doubt it. But what his father did know and what we were just discussing was that he had seen Afghanistan, he had seen the invasion of Prague. Um, he knew that um, the viol violence and war making does not lead to the outcome um, whom, which, which the invaders claim to want, um, and, and nor does it lead to the outcome which the invaded want, of course. Um, there, so as you say, there is this um, remarkable amount of nationalism and pride and feeling of independence and a rediscovery of native Ukrainian culture uh, within the last eight years. What, what Russia, Russia's invasion eight years ago, um, it forced Ukrainians to really decide how they feel about an independent Ukraine. Previous eight years ago, people could kind of be Russophiles and Ukrainians at the same time. They, they could they could both have nostalgia for the Soviet Union and claim to be proud of an independent Ukraine. But as of eight years ago, you really had to decide where you stood. Um, and um, I think it was, it, it was largely a generational separation. He would have been born just before Ukrainian independence. You mentioned that um, um, this is something the Ukrainians hadn't had before. As you know, that's not exactly right. The, the Ukrainian nationalist movement began in the 19th century um, and um, it was suppressed by the czars and it was suppressed by the Bolsheviks and by Stalin. But in fact, the, the Ukrainian partisan cause wasn't conclusively put down until after Stalin died in 53. Um, they have had these inclinations and these, um, these uh, intimations of Ukrainian independence um, and nationalism, but it's been so suppressed for so long. And it's still suppressed in many ways in Ukraine. There are many parts of Ukraine still where you may as well be in Russia. It's Russian that's spoken, it's Russian culture that's consumed, it's Russian news that's watched. Um, there are many parts of Ukraine that that would be indistinguishable from Russia for, for, for outsiders. One of the uh, points that you just raised a moment ago really gets to the heart of the argument about identifying Ukraine. You said, for example, that in the mid 19th century, there was, I don't know the words that you used, but you left me with the impression that you think that in the mid 19th century, there was a Ukraine, a nation with borders, yeah. uh, a nation that could be recognized by other nations. Even people who live there would recognize themselves as independent. But James, that simply was not true. In the mid 19th century, you had one illustration after another, and it was sort of obvious why of Ukrainians, like the great writer Nikolai Gogol, for example. Gogol had an opportunity to write his great books in Ukrainian, but he wrote them in Russian. And he wrote them in Russian for a couple of reasons. Russia was the mother language. It was what he was raised to believe was the language of his country. But Russia was, has always been a nation broken down into different groups, with the Russian I mean, in addition to Ukraine, you'd had Belarusia, you had Georgia, you had Armenia, you had even the Kazakhstan's group out in Central Asia. 
Each one of them, ironically, was encouraged by Stalin first, excuse me, Lenin first, and then Stalin to think of themselves as independent, but within the larger framework of a communist or czarist structure. Part of the difficulty we have today as outsiders looking in at that problem is it is so intensely complicated. It is wrapped up in history that is so difficult to analyze. For example, um, if you spend any time in Kiev, you come upon Vladimir, Prince Vladimir, who in 988 uh, decided that he would become Christianized and everybody under his rule would be Christianized. The Russians claim that's the beginning of their state. Yeah. Modern Ukrainian nationalists claim that's the beginning of their state. Yeah. So have an argument about that. You got a war over it. And the answer is for the Russians, apparently, yes. They're prepared to use military force. Whether they will this time, as you said before, yeah. who knows? Do you actually think that? The Ukrainians, as you write in your piece, many of them are prepared to fight for their country, die for their country. And I'm wondering if, if you, I'm asking you to generalize now, and I'm sorry, but if you take the people you knew on your trip, try to nationalize that experience, are the Ukrainians today prepared to fight for their borders? as they see them? Yes, uh, Mar just briefly, uh, to be clear, before I wasn't saying there was a Ukrainian nation in the 19th century, I was saying there was a nationalist movement. There were people lobbying for, a, there were people pushing for a Ukrainian nation, pushing for the use of Ukrainian language, uh, Ukrainian native cultural custom, um, which was suppressed not just by the czars, but by Stalin as well. Um, Into the 19th century throughout Europe, all of Europe, yes. Eastern yeah. and West, there of was course. a rise of nationalism. Of course. People were having good feelings about themselves. They wrote books in their own language. All of that was happening. Yeah. But it didn't mean that nations grew out of those feelings. So, those where it didn't. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, to get to uh, your second, uh, to, to your question, um, yes, undoubtedly many Ukrainians I met would fight for Ukraine. They are all of them um, very tired of this conflict. The front line in Eastern Ukraine has been stalemated <laughs> since 2015, more or less. Um, what you encounter among soldiers on the front line and certainly civilians is frustration and consternation and boredom, um, which is usually the case in conflicts, short and long conflicts. Um, but certainly the soldiers are, are willing to and eager to fight. The, um, aside from it, the soldiers in the front line in the East are eager, the civilians, not so much. The civilian population in Donbass and Eastern Ukraine um, is quite old. First of all, it's an aged population. It's made up in large part of pensioners. Um, it is a highly Russophile population in the East. These are people who, um, many of whose families were sent to resettle the East after the Second World War when it had been destroyed. And Stalin sent many Russians um, and others from all over the empire um, to resettle Donbass and rebuild it. Um, these are people who consider themselves um, Russian in more or less every way, or they might, uh, they might not use that term, but um, their fondest memories are of the Soviet Union. It's an area where there's a great deal of nostalgia and regret over the demise of the Soviet Union. In the, in the same way that Putin has said that 
the collapse of the Soviet Union represented the greatest geopolitical ca catastrophe of, of, our, of our time in the 20th century. A lot of people in the East feel that way. And so tip, traditionally in Ukraine, the Russophile sentiment and Russophile political uh, allegiances tend to be strongest in the South and in the East. So Donbass, so the, area, the areas in, uh, around Donbass and the areas around Odessa, and of course in Crimea. The farther north and west you get towards Kyiv, uh, Lviv, et cetera, towards uh, the Transcarpathia, um, the more nationalism you encounter, the more patriotism you encounter, the more manifestations of traditional Ukrainian culture you encounter, the more speaking of the Ukrainian language you hear, um, and also, not surprisingly, the more youthful the population becomes, because that's where the jobs are, um, up in the northwest of the country. Um, and there's also, in that part of Ukraine, more of, more of a feeling of connection to Western Europe uh, and to Europe. That part of Ukraine was uh, more a part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, and there's always been, and certainly is today, more of a feeling of being European as opposed to uh, Russian. Right. Can you imagine, on the basis of what you just said, James, can you imagine an outcome, hardly tomorrow, but at some point, that sees Ukraine split? Split down the Dnieper? Well, I mean, Russia? It is. Go it ahead. is it, it is split today. The, you know the Donba the occupied portions of Donbas comprise I forget what it is I think seven thousand square miles, and then Crimea of course is huge. So in many ways Ukraine is already split, just as Georgia is split, just as Moldova is split. Um, could I envision a a larger split? Um, well, I'm not the right person to ask about that. I'm certainly not. I'm certainly not an expert. Um, I can. I can. I certainly wouldn't put it past Russia to try to occupy more of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I think what I was getting at is that on the basis of your reporting, when you would go into a place like Kharkov, for example, uh, which I don't know how many miles it is from the Belarus or the or the Russian to sell border. Kharkov or Kharkiv? Kharkiv. Kharkiv, yeah. Yes. Kharkov's in Russia, yeah. Yes. The, it, how, how far away is that from the border? Kharkov or Kharkiv? Kharkiv. Uh, Kharkiv is um, about, what, it's about a five hour drive from the Eastern border. Ah. Okay. It's roughly an equidistant drive from Kiev to the east. Uh, Kharkiv is, Kharkiv is um, central eastern Ukraine. Right. And when you were driving from Kiev eastward into Donbass, you have some wonderful parts of the article where you were describing what it is that you saw along the way. And you talk about having uh, driven through the breadbasket, not only of Ukraine, but Ukraine's breadbasket was very much that for Russia, for parts of Western Europe, for Poland. Yeah. In other words, the, the role that Ukraine has played um, has been large with respect to the East, not as much to the West, although even to the West. It was at one point, as you were saying, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but all, uh, the Poles representing also the Catholic faith or the West represented a different kind of way of life, attitude. Mm. So the country itself institutionally today by faith, by culture, by what they read, mm. where they feel more comfortable, mm. is already geographically, culturally split. Mm. The miracle now for a Ukrainian nationalist is to represent both sides. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what I'm trying to figure out, as I'm sure many other people are, what becomes 
a realistic compromise? Can either side even think of compromise as they imagine a future solution to this problem? Well, I think the what compromise would represent is very different in the minds of Ukrainians and Russians. Um, well, it brings up, you know, it reminds me of, of what kompromat actually means in Russian, which is something far more sinister than what we mean by compromise. compromise. And that's, you, as you know, having reported in Russia a long time, um, it, the, the, the notions of any of these political ideas are simply more cynical in Russia than they are by our standards, right? right. The, uh, the, the, um, Putin is a pragmatist and he is a master of realpolitik um, and he is a former KGB agent uh, working with the Sazi in, in East Germany. Um, our ideas of what compromise are, is, are meaningless to him would be my guess and vice versa, right? Um, I think if for many Ukrainians, compromise would simply mean Russia um, no longer trying to um, bring down their government every day with cyber attacks. It would mean Russia no longer um, uh, playing such a, having such a heavy hand in their economy. Um, it would mean Russia no longer using uh, Donbass as a um, uh, as a, a political prop um, in Russia's dealings with Europe and Washington um, but but that's you know that is um, we're talking about vastly different outlooks of the world in Ukraine and Russia Russia now at least in the, at the highest levels um, would seem to view um, Western Europe, uh, Europe generally, um, the, certainly the United States, as a threat, simply, right? And the part of the reason they're so exercised about Ukraine is they think Ukraine has become part of that threat, of the Western threat, and they claim that many Ukrainians are being brainwashed or, uh, or, or bamboozled over to the Western view. Um, 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 Russia is clearly, Putin, um, though he is a pragmatist, um, in my view, he is also increasingly subject to um, emotional historical reasoning in Russia. So, you know, the seizure or the propping up of Donbass, uh, the propping up of South Ossetia, of Abkhazia, of Transnistria, these don't, these don't really have a pragmatic purpose for Russia. They don't have much to gain in any of these places. Crimea, they do have a great deal to gain. It's home to the Black Sea Fleet. It's extremely valuable real estate. Donbass is not. Donbass has no strategic value. has no economic value. Nor does Transnistria, nor does South of Saudi Abkhazia. What they do have is historical emotional value. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and though we think that Putin doesn't think along those lines, historically, emotionally, he thinks entirely pragmatically, um, macroeconomically. Clearly, we're wrong about that. Clearly, with some, at some point within the last 20 years, um, he has been, to some extent, overtaken by the historical, philosophical, um, emotional arguments of, um, of Russians who would identify themselves as ultranationalists, or who identify, who connect themselves with the idea of new Russia, Novorussia, yeah. you know, which is a czarist concept that's now been reinterpreted to describe this new in Russian imperium. A Russian imperium that, that doesn't have all that much to offer Russia economically or strategically. It's very interesting. A couple of the questions who have now, that have now come in, uh, James, I'd like to go to. And one of them is, why should Russia react differently to a NATO buildup on East European borders? Was it any different from the US reaction to Soviet missiles being put into Cuba in 1962? Uh, could this not be Russia's Monroe Doctrine? It has to do here with obviously a definition of sphere of influence. 
And I think the questioner is, is asking historically accurately yeah. that the United States had a vision of its neighborhood as being under its control and it didn't want anybody else to move military force into it any more mm -hmm. than Putin now wants NATO to move mm -hmm. into, let us say, the Baltic, which are already yeah. there, and Poland. Yeah. There, there are these definitions that we're both sort of trying to understand at this time, because at the heart of the definitions are the differences between the two sides mm -hmm. and the difficulty of trying to come up with an answer. If Putin today says, the West is not responding to my questions. He really wants the West to say that Ukraine is part of a Russian sphere of influence. Mm. He's not saying get out. He's saying he wants to be comfortable that Ukraine will never move against Russia. Mm. That it will always be friendly, quote unquote. Yeah. What do you think? Well, again, I have to emphasize that this is not really my area of expertise. This is not what I was writing about, and I'm not a Russia expert nor a Ukraine expert. Um, but I know that that is what many people in Russia think that they're doing that the that that the Kremlin's argument and position is no no more self-serving than the United States would be, say, in 1962. Um, um, I don't. My, you would know better, Marvin, but my understanding is that that argument is disingenuous insofar as the NATO disposition has not changed very much in Ukraine or Europe in a long time. What, um, what Putin points to as direct provocations uh, from NATO, in fact, NATO has been putting weapons in Ukraine since the Russian invasion eight years ago. Um, aside from that, uh, I could be wrong, but there's no major change in the NATO disposition in its weapons pointed at Russia. Um, and, and, you know, the, uh, the Ukraine has long been talking to the EU and long been talking to NATO, but it's no secret to anyone that NATO doesn't have much interest in including Ukraine among its membership. And the EU has said very plainly that in order for it to consider Ukraine joining any of its, uh, you know, any any of the bodies um, uh, um, that tie Europe together monetarily, um, diplomatically, that Ukraine has to make vast improvements in um, in uh, corruption, in um, in rule of law, etc. So the. The anxieties that Russia is expressing now about Ukraine's inclusion in NATO or EU, they, these same anxieties were around uh, 20 years ago when Putin first came into office. Um, and, and none of them have, have come any closer to reality. And part of the problem, again, from my point of view, anyway, is definition. And how does one understand, you raised this earlier, James, I just want to understand what's going on in Putin's mind. One possible way is to look at history and to ask yourself a question, what would another Russian leader do? What would Khrushchev in his time do faced with a similar situation? What would the Tsar do? What would Nicholas do? What would Peter the Great do? And I think, I think that if you are a student of Russian history, you'll find a sense of continuity as to what the Moscow leader, whether he's called a czar, commissar, Putin, the Moscow leader has a certain vision of what is comfortably his. It doesn't mean that it is his, it's what's in his head. Mm. And that sense of Russian nationalism is extremely powerful. It's been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm. And with the Ukrainian sense of nationalism, that is a relatively new phenomenon. Mm. Doesn't mean, it doesn't mean at all that it shouldn't succeed. 
In fact, personally, I hope it does succeed, but it doesn't mean historically mm -hmm. that it will, that it has the years, the roots to support that kind yeah. of, of point of view. For example, Finland also is attached border to border to Russia. Russia attacked Finland at the beginning of World War II. And I remember in the 1950s and 60s, there was a, a Finnish leader named Kekkonen who used to pay sort of monthly visits to Moscow to talk to Khrushchev, to pat him on the head, to say how, what a wonderful guy he is. And Khrushchev would take him to the Bolshoi theater and they would both applaud um, great dancers and then Kekona would go back and do exactly what he wanted in Finland. And the Russians would let him do it. Mm. Who right now, do you have any sense from your reporting? I'm not asking you to be a historian. From your reporting, is there any feeling within the Ukrainian political establishment that we have to get along with these people somehow are we not smart enough to figure something out that pats Putin on the brain and allows him to relax for a minute while we in Kiev go ahead and build a democracy? Um, well, I didn't do any reporting among um, Ukrainian political higher-ups. My reporting was entirely focused on civilians and soldiers living along the front line. I did speak with people um, in the intelligence community in in Kiev um, and um, some former officials, um, but Ukraine is so profoundly tied to Russia in every way, linguistically, culturally, um, um, economically, um, and there seems to be there is this. Um, a misconception, a kind of binary view of Ukrainian leadership that either it's pro-Russia or pro-Ukraine, that it's either Russophile or Ukrainophile. But uh, first of all, that's not true. And secondly, it would be impossible to do that. They're just, the two places are just too tied to one another. They're also, Ukraine is simply too dependent on Russia um, economically as trading partners, but also Ukraine as a conduit for the Russian oil and gas that goes to Europe. Um, you know, Germany, the large majority of Germany's uh, hydrocarbons come from Russia via Ukraine. And that's the case with much of Europe. They are so tied to one another um, that um, it's much more complicated than a Ukrainian leader having to placate Putin or another Russian leader. Um, uh, the, what, one problem is that Ukraine really has nothing that anyone needs aside from um, being a conduit for Russian hydrocarbons. Ukraine, one reason that the EU and NATO don't have to take Ukraine more seriously is that the poor country has nothing to offer Brussels or London or Washington. Um, and if this, um, if this uh, pipeline that is proposed, that's being built, which will go directly from Russia to Europe, bypassing Ukraine. If that, if that is completed um, and other similar projects are undertaken, then Ukraine won't even have itself to offer as a conduit for energy. And, that, and, then, um, and then it's going to be even worse off. Um, so Ukraine is in an absolutely unenviable position uh, in its relations with Russia. Um, and now it's trying to, um, a lot of Ukrainians are coming into their own as Ukrainians, realizing that at the very least they are not Russian. Um, but what that could possibly mean on the economic or the diplomatic level, I don't think anyone can say that Ukraine is simply still do, too dependent on Russia for it to play anything more than a, um, I don't know what the right word is, um, it's, it's not a, satra a satrapy of Russia any longer in the way that Chechnya is, say. Um, but what is it exactly? It's, it's still so dependent on Russia. That's what puts so many Ukrainians in such an awful position. It also is, it's also inundated by 
Russian media, by Russian propaganda. Um, even very patriotic Ukrainians consume most of what they consume in Russian. They read Russian books, they watch Russian news, they watch Russian movies. They most certainly do. And that does explain um, an inclination to be in one way or another connected with Russia, but that in and of itself fights the new nationalism, which unquestionably exists within the borders of what is now Ukraine. Yeah. And if people still want to eat, and I think they do, Ukraine is still one heck of a breadbasket. It has been for hundreds of years. And so that is an asset which a smart leader could utilize. And I'm searching for some hope, really, <laughs> turning to you as someone who has spent some time there recently, some hope that there is in the Ukrainian personality, the political body of the country, some broad intelligence that says, let's look back, let's realize our dependency or lack of those ingredients that give us a strong hold on nationalism and independence and be realistic. That is my hope. Well, I, don't, they, they, I, I, I think you're asking that of the wrong party. The onus is not on the Ukrainians to ask that question of themselves. It's on the Russians. It's not Ukraine that's menacing Russia. It's not Ukraine that invaded Russia eight years ago. It's the Russians who have to, have to ask that. Isn't there some way that we can get along with this now 30-year sovereign nation to ourselves? Well, that is one of the most difficult things for a Russian nationalist to do. Absolutely right. Yeah. And I don't, think you, I don't think you even have to be particularly nationalist as a Russian to either not care or not see the point of a, an independent Ukraine. No, they are, I think that most Russians uh, feel a connection to Ukraine, that they probably, most Russian families in one way or another have an attachment to Ukraine. As you yourself were writing, the people in Ukraine feel an attachment to Russia. Yeah. The point that I'm getting at is not, James, whether um, the Russians should feel a certain way toward Ukraine, I want to turn it around. Ukraine is now the issue, not Russia. Ukraine is the issue. What is going to happen to this country? Well, I, I, I mean, I, what is going to happen to that country is up to Russia. Left to its own devices, Ukraine will progress. The, 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 the question now is, is not whether Ukraine is going to invade Russia. It's obviously not. The question is whether Russia is going to invade Ukraine. Right. I totally understand that, James. I really do. The question for me, and I think it ends up being a rather fundamental one in diplomatic chanceries all over the world. You can look at it, as you just said. The problem is Russia, it is Putin. Is he going to invade or not? There's another way of looking at it. And I'm simply trying to open the book on that. Um, there has to be a leader, somebody who can understand his or her own country and its needs, look around and say, how do I function? If, if Ukrainian leadership believes that its salvation is only to be hooked into the West, it's dreaming. It'll never happen because the Russians will never completely let go. And I'm simply trying to get from you as a journalist who's just been there to help us try to crack through yeah. that nut. Well, I don't, I don't think, I don't get the sense that that is Zelensky's attitude, that, 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 that Ukraine needs to align itself entirely with the West. That may have been, let's say, Yushchenko's attitude, um, or at least increase uh, aligning with the West. That may have been uh, Yulia, Yulia Tymoshenko's attitude, but I don't get the sense it's Zelensky's. Um, Zelensky owns, owes a lot of his success 
to Russia. Um, he has not, um, Zelensky from the beginning, from coming into office, has made entreaties to Putin to negotiate. He, he ran um, on, the, on the promise of negotiation. He's been attacked by Ukrainian nationalists for um, toadying to Putin. And then of course he's attacked uh, on the other side for not doing enough to seize back uh, the, the occupied territories. But Zelensky has always presented himself, at least from what I've read and, and, and seen of his speeches, as, um, as not an ultranationalist, as someone who wants to speak with Putin. He, he with, so within the framework of the Minsk agreements, which were signed in 2014 and 2015, in the worst days of the war, negotiations um, over Donbass would um, have to conceive of Don if Donbass was to be returned to Ukraine, the Russians insist that it take on a semi-autonomous federalized form, which, um, which Ukraine agreed to in the worst days of the war, but, but Zelensky couldn't possibly agree to now. Uh, one, because it's, it would be political suicide and he's already doing badly enough. Um, but two, because it's Russia's intentions with creating a semi-autonomous East in the Ukraine are very obvious. The Russians don't care about, <laughs> Russians don't care about the, um, the political well-being of Eastern Ukrainians. They want to have influence in Ukraine. They want to, um, they want to be able to further meddle in Ukrainian politics. Having an, a semi-autonomous buffer uh, between the two countries would allow them to do that. It's not, you know, they claim that they are looking out for Russian, uh, Russian uh, ethnic uh, Russians, right? And that they're trying to protect the Russian language. That's laughable. Um, but Zelensky has been um, Zelensky has, has been uh, you know invited Putin more than once to talk, and Putin has turned him down. Right. Um, in the time that we've got left, James, and that's not much. Um, talk to me a little bit. Talk to us a little bit about the role of religion. Um, religion is a powerful force in that part of the world. The Russians care a great deal about Russian orthodoxy. Uh, the Ukrainians used to have a kind of independent branch of orthodoxy. And I'm wondering today, if you went into a church, what kind of feelings are there? Is it a sense that the religion could be the glue that would bind the Russians and the Ukrainians in some way? Well, actually, what you say about the Ukrainian Orthodox Church is wrong. A few years ago, um, it was 2019, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church officially separated itself from the Russian, Russian Orthodox Church and said, we are now the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. That had never happened before. Um, the Greek Catholic Church, by the way, not the Orthodox, the Greek Catholic Church. The U Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church was the name the official name of the Ukrainian branch of orthodoxy for hundreds of years. That, that could be, they now, call themselves the, they now call themselves the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Exactly, um, they most the, certainly the, the, uh, But um, Russian, so in both countries, as you know, um, the church was irrelevant for since 1917, right? Stalin no, had- Wrong. wrong. It was never irrelevant. It was at the heart of the people and what they wanted. It's it was Russia. the way in which, James, it was the way in which the Communist Party used the church. Stalin needed it during World War II and gave it a new life, gave it a lot of money. Sure. Yeah, well, that's, that's not my understanding of it. You'd know better. Um, no, no. In any event, the, the Russian Orthodox Church, as you know, um, has been revived under Putin, or it's been returned to cultural prominence, and he's used it um, as a political crutch. But that doesn't mean that Russians are now devout. You know, some of them are, but many, many generations of families lived from the Russian Revolution until... 1991, never having gone to church, not stepped foot in a church, much less prayed. 
Um, that's, it's not as though Russians were secretly devout throughout the Soviet Union. Most of them were not. And that's the case in Ukraine as well. The Ukrainian Orthodox Church, though it has reasserted itself, is not um, a political force in Ukraine. Most, most Ukrainians you meet grew up atheists, just like most Russians you meet who are, you know, who are over the age of 30. Um, that's no secret. Zelensky is Jewish. Um, but and and you know, Ukraine used to be a hotbed of, of course, of anti-Semitism, but uh, but Zelensky is Jewish, which you know goes to show that um, there is a fair amount of religious tolerance in Ukraine, unlike in Russia. Mm -hmm. Could there be a, a, a point of um, agreement between Russia and Ukraine on um, on Orthodox Christianity or, or or Russian or Ukrainian Orthodox Christianity? Um, very good question. I I wouldn't begin to know the answer to that. Okay, uh, one kind of um, wrap up theme. You use the word in your article about a stalemate concerning the war in the Donbass in that region itself. Uh, from your reporting, do you see an outline of a possible resolution of this problem? Because if you do, you could be very helpful to many of the diplomats running to Kiev now with their own ideas. Maybe Verini can come in with his idea now. No, I mean, I don't. Um, I, I, um, um, aside from the fact of the front line, aside from um, the obvious presence of Russia in the occupied territories in Luhansk and Donetsk, uh, aside from all of the obvious practical matters and the facts on the ground, there is a, a generations old um, um, cultural and emotional issue that can't possibly be addressed diplomatically. And that is uh, the people in Eastern Ukraine, many of them um, feel a great deal of longing for a great deal of nostalgia over the Soviet Union. They greatly regret its disintegration um, and they have no use for an independent Ukraine. Um, and, um, and many of their children and grandchildren feel exactly the reverse. They have no nostalgia for the Soviet Union. They never knew it. And they, have, um, they do know that their part of Ukraine is badly off, but that doesn't mean that they have any, any nostalgia for what preceded it. That, um, that is not something you can address diplomatically or militarily, or um, perhaps you can address it economically, but that's not going to happen either in Eastern Ukraine. These are, these are problems of history and thought and psychology um, that really can only eventually have personal resolutions for people. People can either stop um, longing for the past, or they they either will stop longing for the past, or they won't. And eventually, the conflict in eastern Ukraine, um, though, as you point out rightly, it's immensely complex um, and um, has a great deal to do with the legacy of the Soviet Union, the legacy of the Tsars, and many other things, the legacy of the Second World War. It's not complex in that it boils down to this. The conflict is between people who want to return to the past and people who don't. Um, and that is um, largely generational, but it's also psychological. It's a powerful thought, James. Thank you so very much uh, for being with us today and chatting with us today. I think that um, in your writing and in your comments, you have added a great deal to our knowledge and on behalf of the Pulitzer Center, I certainly thank you very, very much. And I'm gonna turn this all over to Ann Peters now if she could pick it up. Thanks very much. And we're so thankful uh, to you, Marvin, and to you, James, for sharing your time with us today. And to our audience, just want to let you know, remember that the recording of this conversation will be online at pulitzercenter.org in the coming day, so, days, so please feel free to share. Thanks also to my colleagues at Pulitzer Center, uh, Holly Pippenberg in particular, our producer for this session. We appreciate all of you in our audience for joining us.
And for those of you who are able, please consider becoming a Pulitzer Center champion to support our work. Please also join us for other virtual events. Two upcoming that I wanted to mention in particular, this Thursday, February 3rd, in an event organized by the Overseas Press Club, our executive editor, Marina Waka Guevara, speaks with journalist Nadja Dros about how Nadja reported her Pulitzer Prize winning story on migrants crossing the Darien Gap. And next week on Tuesday, February 8th, we'll have multimedia freelance journalist Mariana Palau speaking about her investigative reporting from Colombia and the impact of the, of the 2021 Breakthrough Journalism Award on her work. Applications for the 2022 Breakthrough Journalism Award are now open. Visit PulitzerCenter.org to learn more. Thank you again for joining us. And please, if you could take the brief survey, once we officially end, we're eager to hear from you. Goodbye for now.